my training is as a physicist, uh, theoretical statistical mechanics, and if you ask what that means, it means taking the motion of large numbers of uh, particles, atoms, and aggregating them, looking for patterns in space and time. About 10 years into doing that professionally, I became responsible for overseeing on behalf of the College of Natural Sciences the preparation of science and mathematics teachers in collaboration with the College of Education. Tony Petrosino is one of the people I worked with uh, from the early days, and that spread across the country. So now I'm partly overseeing 7,000 odd students becoming math and science teachers. These are wonderful people, and I had to wonder what I was sending them into. So I began taking the statistical mechanics half of my brain and using it to look at the system into which I was sending people. So I'll tell you some of the things that came out of that. I think I prepared at this point around 1,500 plots, probably more, and I won't have time to show you all of them, although if I went really fast, I could try. Um, but I, I would like to start with another thought, which is in a way is recursive. So I'm going to be telling you stories that have to do with uh, products of the educational system, many of them about Texas, because we're in Texas and I'm in Texas, uh, some of them about uh, the rest of the United States. And many of these stories will have to do with the intersection of poverty and educational outcomes. And I have a graph here that I will uh, talk about a little bit later, showing percentage of college-ready students as a function of poverty concentration. Now, what I'd like to mention is that we are a disruptive crowd. I don't, I'm not sure we've heard the word, word disruptive very often, but it's in the back of all of our minds that things such as knowledge analytics and the data visualization are intended to disrupt current systems and replace them. And I would like to see the thought, which is that in disrupting things that are this old and this big, there is a very large risk, and the risk is that from those who we will find have the least, who are over on the right-hand side of this plot, the disruptions will have the effect of transferring what little they have over to the left-hand side. And that will happen for many reasons, but partly because all of us are actually on the left-hand side and will instinctively move in ways to serve our own interests, and because all the people who pay us are also over there on that left-hand side. And I think each of us can probably examine our, our motivations and the subtle biases on our professional lives and see the way those pressures could work out. Um, I can only really think of one countervailing force, which is that we each individually decide not to let that happen. And so I would, I would encourage everybody, including myself, to be thinking about a bigger picture at all times as you work on a technical fix for something. Ask what it will do when all the pressures uh, of so many sorts will be to move resources from those who have the least to those who have the most and ask whether you're contributing to that or blocking it. So with that, I'm going to tell you a few data stories to illustrate themes that have gone throughout this conference about the way that data interacts with stories. One of the things I found uh, very early on is that it's not hard to take uh, a single data source and tell very, very different types of stories. And it's interesting to explore what some of those look like. I'll start with a brief example, just with discussions of uh, international data sets, although I'll spend most of my time on the United States and on some more detailed cases. One of the most discussed pieces of data has to do with the uh, failing of the United States in competitiveness. Our students are <laughs> below students in the rest of the world, and these are results from the PISA exam, uh, 2012 PISA mathematics results. And in fact, it's easy to check that the story that we are uh, below the rest of the world is, is really true. You have to scan pretty far down even to find the first US state, which is Massachusetts. And then there's the United States uh, down there by Croatia, and Florida's even below Croatia. So. Um, this does tell a worrying story, and this has been used in many venues to, to wild people up and get them worried about the future of the country. I'll show you just one example of replotting basically the same data in a slightly different way that at least gives you a somewhat different view of it. And all I have done here is to take many of those same countries with the same scores, but I've now plotted the data versus on the horizontal axis uh, calculations of child poverty rates. So this is child poverty actor taxes and transfers, trying to estimate the extent to which uh, the country ameliorates the effects of low income on children in particular. 
in the United States, this is actually a very big project. It's been NSF funded since the late 60s, so a lot of effort goes into obtaining this rather innocent number. And what you see in it is that the U.S. is still uh, viewed in this way, nothing to be extraordinarily proud of, but there is, roughly speaking, an upper envelope with uh, only Japan and Poland falling uh, well above it. And Poland is a recent newcomer to that, which is interesting. Uh, apart from that, at any given level of poverty, whether you plot, plot disaggregated schools or individual states or the US as a whole, we're more or less on the upper envelope. So that's at least thought provoking and maybe uh, causes one to question a narrative about the schools failing because if no country with that level of poverty or no state with that level of poverty manages to better, then maybe the problem is more challenging than it seems. And just emulating another country's educational system without addressing the broader social system might, have any, might not have a desired causal effect. So uh, let me move on to uh, some stories involving the United States. One that I heard uh, very early on was that US test scores were flatlining and our costs had doubled. And this has been repeated many times, and it's led to calls to be very disruptive uh, about the US educational system. Um, I downloaded uh, eighth grade NAEP data, and I will show you something from that. So Hans Rosling showed up in the early uh, keynote this morning. So on this chart, every bubble is a state. That's California. That's Tennessee. Free lunch fraction is the color, poverty concentration proxy. The size of every bubble shows you the total number of students. On the horizontal axis is eighth grade mathematics from the National Assessment of uh, Educational Progress for better off students. And on the vertical axis, you see the same thing for low income students. So um, you're going up. Uh, low income students are doing better. You're going to the right. Uh, better off students are doing better. I'm going to turn on time. We're starting in the year 2000, and we're going to go ahead and see how the states do. So if they're flatlining, they just stay where they are. But they're going both up, so the low-income students are doing better, and to the right, so the well-off students are doing better. Even that little jurisdiction there. Look at it go. Watch, watch. Who's that? Can you get this? Who's that? Yes, District of Columbia. Very good. Um, and so here we are. There's California. North Carolina, Ohio, New Jersey, and the big surprise for me was Texas, up there with the highest scores in mathematics for low-income students, and overall just a hair behind Massachusetts. So curiously enough, um, the two states, which in some ways are furthest apart in many of their traditions and habits, have been occupying the top spot. And I think everybody would know that about Massachusetts, and nobody would know about Texas, including Texans. <laughs> Here's another uh, static representation of some of the same things. And I believe that actually this morning, new NAEP data have been released with 12th grade, grade mathematics results. And I'm sorry, I'm slow. I haven't had time to put them in yet. Um, this graph shows the long-term NAEP progress over time of uh, nine-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and 17-year-olds. Uh, and it breaks those down by white African-American and Latino students. The growth for the nine-year-olds, the uh, fourth and eighth graders, has been very, very large. So if you look at where Hispanic students are now, comparison where they were in the late 70s when this began, they've nearly reached the point where eighth graders used to be. So a legitimate claim that there's been a, you know, a four-year growth in learning that's occurred over these decades. So group by group, um, there's been a great deal of progress, with the one exception being at high school, which stalled out in 1990. And if you look at the newspaper reports coming out of today, uh, out of uh, high school results, there is apparently more of this. I've just read the new newspaper accounts, but apparently um, people are astonished. They said there's still growth at fourth and eighth grade, but high school isn't moving. Why could that be? And uh, I don't know, uh, although I think actually teacher shortages are probably the main explanation, but it does surprise me that anyone would be surprised since this pattern has been in place uh, since 1990. Um, now, a another narrative I've often heard is that um, 
particularly union protections, are a very large problem for school systems. And one of the things I looked at, again, very early on, was the uh, connection between strong union protections and student performance state by state. Um, difficult to pick out any, any pattern. I've disaggregated here, again, by well-off students and low-income students. Um, you can find uh, right-to-work states at both the very top and at the very bottom of uh, these charts. This, incidentally, is Tableau. Thank you very much, Tableau, for providing this wonderful software. Um, and I have also a dynamic representation that may give some idea why it might be that we hear the stories about scores uh, flatlining and prices doubling, when I'll show you that there's a certain amount of evidence that uh, really neither is happening. So here's another view of the NAEP results. Again, there's California. Uh, this time on the horizontal axis, I have uh, NAEP scores for low-income students in eighth grade math. But on the vertical axis, I have total cost for students. And it's now money going that way. This will be in 2009 constant dollars. And math score is going that way. I've color-coded states according to teacher bargaining rights. So the blue states uh, are right-to-work states, limited bargaining rights, the green states have uh, stronger union protections. Um, there's a very large variation in cost per student uh, with Utah at the bottom. And uh, I think at this point, with the data set that was available in 2000, it may have been California. So now everybody um, is going, no, that must have been New York. So everybody's going ahead now. All the states are going along, and most of them actually, the costs are pretty constant, but there are three where costs have really soared. So one of them jumped down a little bit. Any guesses about those? DC, New York, and the one that went up and down? New Jersey. So, um, meanwhile, down at the bottom in terms of cost, Utah, Idaho, and Texas held really remarkably flat. So here's my interpretation of the public narrative about flatlining scores and doubling costs. The media are located in New York, New Jersey, and the District of Columbia. Their scores have flatlined. Their costs have doubled. And they're telling the whole country the way it is. Um, I'm going to talk now about something else, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time actually on data that come. This says uh, SAT, but actually this is, these are SAT, ACT data. Um, we talked about privacy earlier on. Um, actually, Texas and most states have put uh, some collection of SAT, ACT data available freely on the web for every school. So you can look them all up, you know, all that stuff that was being blacked out in the previous slide. It's probably all out there already. The states have put it out for themselves. Um, when I tried to get it, incidentally, from SAT or ACT, I was never successful, but it's still, still out there. Um, I want to say a little bit about this plot, because there's a point about it that, um, that bothers me a little bit. One of, the, one of the mantras of statistics is that correlation is not causality. But there's also a new mantra, and the new mantra is no causality without correlation. There's been a remarkable development in the last 25 years of methods for looking at observational data and beginning to make causal claims. Uh, I've been learning about a lot of this. And in fact, if you contrast um, different views of this, there are, there are remarkably um, contradictory views about what to do with observational data. Because on the one hand, there's the view, for example, of the Institute for Education and Sciences that only a random control trial can yield actionable causal data and then on the other hand, you have companies like Google that, so far as I know, are not doing random controlled trials in order to make uh, daily decisions. So there's got to be something in the middle. And I believe that all the work that's been done by people like Pearl and Morgan and Winship and other uh, people of that type, um, propensity score matching and Heckman corrections, uh, this is the way through all of it. Um, so this is, I'm showing here simply a correlation between poverty concentration uh, through its proxy free and reduced lunch and percent meeting a Texas SAT ACT based criterion for college readiness. Um, and it is just a correlation, but I think there is a causal story which is embedded within it. Here, every bubble is a school. So these are all the high schools in Texas. This is the year 2011 data. The color indicates um, 
Latino and African American fraction in the student body, the size is the number of graduates, and the height means the percentage of students who graduated, took the SAT or ACT, and got 11, 10 or more on the SAT, or 24 or more on the ACT. So it's, uh, you could call it the, I can go to college out of state if I want to, criteria. <laughs> And the correlation is very strong. The thing which I think is the greatest causal significance is the white space. It's really not the dots that tell you anything. It's the place where there are none and never have been any. So if you go to 80% free and reduced lunch or higher and look above 30% uh, college readiness by this criterion, there's never been a school that did it. And I think that observation places constraints on a lot of narratives. So one narrative is that uh, and you can find quotations to this effect in many places, is that if we had you know, resolute enough teachers and determined enough administrators, there is no limit to what students can and will do. And it's just a question of our resolve in doing that. Um, and so in the face of that narrative, I ask, then why has no one ever done it? Um, now there's a particular class of schools that has interacted with this narrative the most, which are the charter schools. So I'm not going to highlight them. Um, let me just ask, anyone want a hazard who hasn't seen this before want a hazard where they are on this chart? Yeah, to top or the bottom of this you know, thing here. Anyone want to make a guess? They're all, well, let's just have a look, okay? So about 200 um, secondary charters, and they're about 180 on the horizontal axis. Then there are some that are perfectly good. You know, the ones that we hear about, yes, KIT, IDEA, Harmony, are genuinely good, strong schools, but they are, I, I think it's safe to say, they're towards the upper end of the envelope of what our society currently makes possible. They do not break the envelope. And then there are many, many that are far below. Now, in their defense, I'll say <coughs> most of them are rescue recovery schools. They do not have a college readiness mission. But I think this does tell a story. And the story helps change uh, you know, perceptions about a particular um, mechanism that you know, both policymakers and educators have been asking about in trying to improve the school system. Now, it's great to make fun of Texas. So you may say, well, that's Texas. You know, that wouldn't be any other state, would it? Um, so let's just have quickly have a look uh, at a few other states. So here's California. Uh, same measure, incidentally. I managed to get the, the same thing. And notice almost exactly the same pattern, as if we're a single country. Um, <laughs> and there are the charter schools. That's a different story from Texas. They seem to be more tightly regulated, but still not breaking the envelope. Um, Massachusetts doesn't give a threshold. Massachusetts gives averages. And uh, their charter schools are all on the upper boundary, but again, uh, not breaking out. And I'll show a few more. Um, New York which has played a very important role in the charter school movement, has a few scattered ones uh, up towards the top. But in terms of scores, not, uh, not big matches for the famous uh, magnet school, Stuyvesant Bronx Science, and the others, which I think you know, should at least be prominent in any national discussion of where we want to go with our education systems. And I believe those schools now feel quite embattled. They're not, they're not highlighted favorably, typically, in the press, nor viewed as models. Um, here's New Jersey, again, a media center that celebrates charter schools. Theirs look very much like Texas. Tony, you've been there. Um, Illinois is very interesting. Illinois is the one place where some, this, these are, there are some huge networks of charter schools in Chicago. And the one at the top, I believe, is Noble Street. And it really does seem to stand out. So if you ask, you know, is there anywhere in the country where a charter school network seems to stand out in a large scale from the other public schools, I would say, yeah, Chicago. And so just quickly, a few other states to show that I don't sleep enough. Uh, <laughs> so that, that was an example of charts which I think tell a little bit of a causal story. <coughs> Um, exactly what sort of causal story, I'm not fully sure. I'm still thinking about that. I now want to show you another case uh, that draws even more explicitly on my physics background. I got at one point access to the full Texas educational data set and then was very puzzled. I didn't know what to do with it. There were these, you know, 27 million records of 6 million students. It's not really big data. I mean, it still fits in the thumb drive, basically, but it's, you know, kind of big. So, 
I started thinking as if I was in statistical mechanics and started doing things. So let me tell you the representation I came up with and then things I learned from it. So um, begin by picking all the, let's say, all the well-off students not eligible for free and reduced lunch to score between 60 and 70 percent on math packs in some year, spring 2005. So you find all of them and you group them together and then you find the average score change that they have. So you've really just disaggregated a lot, you've, you've, you've stratified into little tiny groups and then you just uh, go forward. This is exactly what you do in fluid mechanics to find fluid velocities. It's the, it's, it's the exact move that you make in that case. And so now you have an arrow that points, the area is proportional to the number of students, the direction points to the average score change if you go over for a year and you assemble them all together and you end up with a plot that represents the motion of students. Um, each, each line, each column here happens to be a separate cohort in this representation, so, but it's students flowing through the school system. So those are the well-off students, and here are the low-income students. So I've done this, and I've, there's a whole bunch of math that you can do with it. Um, many people would say, oh, that's really cool. Can you do anything with it? So I'll tell you something that I eventually was able to do with it. Um, and it comes from having observed the following sequence. So I started, instead of um, taking snapshots from a single year, I grouped things by cohorts. So I was following in individual cohorts of students through the schooling system. And as I flip through, I'll show you successive classes. So this is the class of 2008, and the data system began uh, where I show it. I just didn't have data before then. So this is the start of this particular testing regime in Texas. Um, and 2009, 2010, 2011, notice that the pattern is really pretty static. And then in going from 2011 to 2012, I noticed a pretty, I'll show it again to the low income students. Uh, look at this line right here. The number of failing students almost vanished. And the arrows before, uh, particularly before fifth and eighth grade pointed up. And then that new pattern persisted and it persisted as the, if we get to the present and we lose the right hand of the data system. It's, it's watch for the same thing with the low income students where it's even more striking. So here we go. So there's a basically static pattern up through 2011. And then as we go through 2012, there's a leap up here and then almost the disappearance, a leap up over there, not as uh, dramatic a disappearance of the low scoring students. And then that new pattern persists. So I got very curious. I happened to be visiting the Dana Center and uh, showed them these pictures and asked them what it was. And they said, oh, that had to be SSI. So um, a, a policy that was passed, I think, when was it? Um, around 1999. Uh, half a billion dollars was spent on it ultimately. It contained a number of different components, but the, the essential components were um, you had to pass uh, math and reading in third, fifth, in fifth and eighth grade, or you would th the school would threaten that they wouldn't advance you, although the actual number of cases where students were not advanced was not nearly as large as you would think, and the retention rates ultimately didn't go up very much, but there was the threat. Then students got to take the exam multiple times, and then there was uh, progressive waves of, of education, both for them and for people who would educate them along the way. So um, the fingerprint just seems unmistakable. The policy comes into place and for precisely, and it rolled through. So it followed the lucky class of 2012, which had the benefit of um, this you know, accelerated mathematics instruction and accelerated reading um, initiative to, to follow it, and their scores followed. If you now look at what you, you know, various consequences that, that this might have, um, another representation is to uh, follow trajectory. So pick students in the fourth grade and uh, follow them, follow their average scores, literally as a cohort, all the way through school. And there are a variety of things you find. First of all, that the ones who are lower scoring leap up. And then if you look before and after this initiative, that the numbers who made it through at the top level, you'll find that for the low income students, before, in the year before this initiative, there were 19,300 students heading through school on the highest trajectory. Let's call it the college-bound trajectory. And the next year, there's 30,600 students going through on that trajectory. And the shape of the trajectory is unchanged. There's absolutely no evidence that uh, 
in any measure that was measured by the, anything that was measured by the state that uh, despite this very, very large increase in the space of a year, um, anything else was going wrong or was different. So the state put in place a policy, spent a half a billion dollars, and by this measure, it actually worked. But there are a couple things I have to comment about that. Um, no one knew it. Even the originators thought that it had not. And the reason for that was that immediately in the year after the test, there was a large drop. So there was a huge leap up in the year of the test and then a drop down. And that was very discouraging to the people who designed the whole system. The drop did not reach back to zero. It was still large compared to many other educational innovations and have, um, have been proposed. But um, a longitudinal study of this sort wasn't done. Concludes have failed, uh, largely defunded in 2010, and uh, I haven't seen any. I haven't seen this decision, you know, discussion of bringing anything like it back. Um, here's another representation of that, just showing uh, gains of the post-intervention uh, students with the pre-intervention students, and for fun, I've put on a yellow bar that indicates the magnitude of gain that might be expected if. Uh, lowest quartile teachers were replaced by highest quartile teachers based on the value-added literature. Just, just to give a sense of the scale of the changes that seem to have occurred on a statewide basis. So um, this story is a claim that sometimes educational interventions work. And if you don't have a flexible framework that lets you pose and explore stories, you may not even find it. Once you find it, you can turn on every other sort of statistical test. But what precisely should you test? I think visualization has key advantages in letting you rapidly explore possibilities. And it also, as many speakers have remarked, means that it's not only the specialists who can do that, but many people can move into the discussion and can talk about the sorts of things that are going on. For example, the person who told me about the SSI was not a data analyst. It was someone who had participated in the professional development of the fifth grade teachers and remembered having done that and then saw a visual representation that triggered the memory of those times. Um, so I think I, I'm going to close. I'm going to show you maybe just one, um, one final graph that I did uh, just two nights ago. Texas is, has put in a very uh, aggressive and interesting change in its high school graduation uh, requirements. Uh, many courses that I thought were essential, chemistry, physics, algebra 2, are no longer required by default. Um, and part of this happened because of a general impression within the state that low income and minority students have not been treated um, particularly well and that the problem was sufficiently severe that a radical course change was required. Um, I've I've got a sort of a final illustration of telling stories through data, a plot of a college readiness measure, which I think is the most general and the best to use for Texas. Again, all the high schools in Texas, uh, poverty concentration here, and uh, a very broad measure of college readiness. This basically means the fraction of students who could go into a community college and without further testing uh, be able to enroll in a long-term certificate or an associate's degree. They wouldn't need to take an additional multiple choice test. Um, if they've met this. So this is back in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. Um, in fact, even just looking at those pictures one at a time, it's not so easy to, to see the motion. But if you play them in sequence, I think it's really very clear that there has been very steady and ultimately somewhat dramatic motion upwards um, that makes me wonder what the strong impetus was for a course change while that was still in progress. So I'm going to close by echoing everything that we've heard about the significance of data to tell stories. I think that uh, researchers need them, policymakers need them. Um, these graphs, I think, do have causal content, but the exact uh, formal way in which they do is still something I'm, I'm wondering about. I'm not sure when it is that it the graph is just a correlation, and when it is that a graph actually can be used to make a legitimate causal argument. I'd love to discuss that with people. But for the moment, I thank you for your attention, and we'll draw this to a close. <laughs>